Welcome back, my friends, to another episode of the Development by David podcast. This week, my guest is Nick Yaris. Imagine serving 22 years in prison for a murder that you didn't commit. Imagine being a 20-something-year-old young man and being told that you will be placed on death row. This was the life of Nick Yaris. You might have seen Nick Yaris on Joe Rogan or have seen his documentary, The Fear of Thirteen. Nick jumps on today for the first time in years to share his story once again. I'd like to say this is a very poetic, symbolic podcast, but also we touch on very, very personal subjects, so listener discretion is advised. Nick's story is huge in length and is just momentous all around, so I've decided to chop this into two parts. This is part one. I really hope you enjoy it, and I'm sure you'll be around for part two. This week's episode is sponsored by you. As you know, I don't get paid for this podcast and a lot of tremendous amounts of work goes into it. And that's fine because it's my passion. I love it. But if you appreciate and value the episodes that I put out, you can sponsor this episode by sponsoring my coffee. Yes, you can caffeinate this very episode by heading to buymeacoffee.com forward slash D by D. It would mean the world. I love a cappuccino. You can go there and buy me one. The link's in the bio, but thank you for listening. Nick Yaris, welcome to my podcast. I can't believe I'm saying this. I am with the man himself. I've been wanting this moment for so long, mate. This is a real, real privilege. How are you today, Nick? I'm so grateful to be here because you're part of the energy that brought everything about today thank you david thank you for entrusting me with your time and with your abilities it is like a real pleasure it's nothing but a pleasure nick usually as you might have seen the style of my podcast is very chronological it starts from someone's birth to to where they're at now but with you i want to take it a little bit in reverse um, I, 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 I want to ask, what brought you and I together today? What, what purpose was it As for? You know, so, last year, I was parked in my RV along the Pacific Ocean, just south of a town called Gold Beach, Oregon. Everything in my life had gotten topsy-turvy, twisted, and ruined because the pandemic ruined the speaking industry. In March of 2020, I was booked to be in Copenhagen at the Royal Ballet Theater for five nights. Following my speech at the London School of Film, where my film, The Fear of 13, was created, I had all this opportunity ahead of me Everything was going to be okay. And then I lost everything. I became homeless. My wife and my children and I ended up living in the forest in a motor home that I mentioned. After a while, my wife and I separated when she left. She went back into town and she met someone who could provide for her and her children, I guess, and she left me. I was devastated. I had lost everything, David. I was sitting by the ocean like an outcast of my own life, waiting for Diana the Hunter or some mythological creature to come out and lead me to who I wanted to be. So the irony of all ironies of you and I being friends is because a woman spit in another woman's face in a restaurant while being served food. Now, as convoluted as that seems, the following unfolded. I was sitting by the seaside and I went into the town to go get meager supplies for myself, propane and food and food for my two dogs that I only had left. So I went into a small shop And I began speaking to this woman. It's a very polite exchange. You see, it's strange. 
I had met a shaman only a few days before this. And the shaman had mentioned to me that it would be only through the crystals that I would see things. The woman working in the shop was named Crystal. Irony. We began talking and she related to me that in her other job in a restaurant, a woman was so incensed that she was serving her food without wearing a mask that the, pa the patron actually spit in her face. As she oh. told me this story, I said, that's really horrible. But every time I come into this job that you work, I'll be exceedingly polite to you to make up for the bad behavior of that one patron. She said, you know what? You're such a fine person. We have an opening in that restaurant where I work. Why don't you think about coming and working at my restaurant? I went back to the seaside and I thought about it. And that day I met a man named James Washington. He was 70 years old. He was riding a moped across America, pulling a small cart so that he could have spinal surgery in South Carolina, 3,000 miles away, so that his elderly aunt could care for him in post-op. When he pulled up next to my motorhome, I tried to take care of James the best that I could but I had meager provisions. But for the three days that he stayed beside me, resting, having driven down, ridden this bike down from Portland, where he began, 300 miles north of me. I went into town and I got an interview set up at the restaurant where Crystal worked. Immediately, I was hired as a cook. That day, I finished the shift and I brought James home food. It was wonderful. He said I had made him the best food he had tasted in the longest time. I gave him a motorcycle helmet because the one that he had was so big it was falling down in his eyes. I sent him on his way down to the nearest town of Brookings, Oregon, to my friend who worked at a motor shop to fix his bike and weld a park for him, send him on his way. And I began going to work every day at that restaurant. I sat there every day after work wondering who would be the next person. One morning after I woke up, I noticed that there was a white car beside me parked along the ocean side, right by what's called Pistol River, Oregon. I didn't know who was in the vehicle. I only knew that there was somebody new there, hoping that after my shift at the restaurant, I'd get to say hello. I decided to make some food to bring home with me just in case. A guy and his dog turned out to be occupying this car. His name is Alex. When he got out of the car, I noticed that he had a walking stick, even though he wasn't old and that he had an issue with his leg, and he had a brilliant dog with him by the name of Bishop. Immediately, my two dogs, Mango and Blue, ran off with his dog, Bishop, off to the seaside, and Alex and I soon followed, talking to one another in our greeting and meeting each other. He said he'd only ended up next to me by mistake because he really wasn't going to go that far south. He was intending to go back to Washington State, some 500 miles north where he lived. So we got the dogs back and we started hanging out. And I had chairs set up outside of my RV and he came over. We began talking. And I found out that he grew up in Virginia, just the same area where Crystal lived. I told him the story about what happened to Crystal after I met the shaman and how she told me that I was going to meet him. It was then that Alex told me that he had been living with cancer that had killed everybody 
within six months of being diagnosed with it and that he had been living with cancer for nine years. And he had told me that night something was changing. The more I revealed my life to him, the things I'd gone through to bring me to that moment of meeting him, he said that all his life he felt like he never met anybody who could appreciate this arduous, enormous challenge he was facing until he met me. And that's when I related to him that it was okay, that he wasn't even the first person to feel this way. And how I, as a, a scholar of all the many religions of the world, related to him, the story of Thomas, the twin, Jesus's brother, a beautiful, articulated man who spoke eloquently about music and art, but would never get the recognition of his brother, Jesus, because the ecumenical society eviscerated his memory. We're not allowed to indulge in the, the, the citizenship of a beautiful human being who struggled only because of the gracious beauty of his own brother. And when I told that to Alex, it lifted a burden from him. We sat for two weeks camping together. And during that time, we had a moment where we sat late one night and right before us on the surface of the ocean, the Milky Way itself was so bright that it lit the ocean before us. We had never seen anything like this before in our lives where it wasn't the moonlight that was so bright by its reflection upon its surface from the sun reflecting back to us, but the stars in the heavens lit up this beautiful calm water before us. And we made a promise that in six months we would meet again. We were going to reunite despite cancer or whatever I had to do and he had to do we made a plan that we were going to hang out again as friends because what we experienced in these week or so of being friends meant so much to us. Alex has this unique ability about him that he doesn't want to kill his cancer. Every time he goes to his appointments, after a while, he developed this notion that he should encourage his doctors to continue staying alive because he intended to be back in six months to see how they were doing upon his next checkup. His positivity radiated and it shook me out of my sorrow of what I'd lost and what was taken from me and the humiliation of having people hurt me openly on the internet about my life made me feel so invigorated and alive. I made a promise to Alex. We were going to go to Scotland or I was going to see that he wanted to go to Scotland because he told me when he went there the first time, he felt his body come to life. What's been keeping Alex alive for nine years living with cancer was what he felt in Glasgow. Wow. So I began to pray. I put my heart into it. Not only was I going to come back and meet my friend in six months, and he'd still be alive. I'm gonna get this boy his dream. But how? I don't, I only have two friends in Scotland and he's a wonderful musician. Uh, he has 
this great partner and I knew them from when I was married to a previous woman. So it was like, uh, how can I pull this off? So I continued on. And then you popped up on my radar, David McIntosh. <laughs> but our first conversation even goes to the heart of this story. I said to you, where you at, young man? And you told me. And I said, man, I've been to Edinburgh. I did the Fringe Festival. I loved it. But I have this friend, Alex, and he dreams about going to Scotland to feel alive again. And the first thing he said was, mate, I'll do that. We'll find him a Bonnie lass and we'll <laughs> have some fun. Remember? I remember. I said, that's when I started watching you. I wanted to see who you were. I needed you to be part of this, just like the shaman, just like James, just like Crystal. It's all connecting to me. It's fascinating. But I got way late, didn't I? January, I flipped the car over, almost get killed. February, I get blood poisoning and almost die. I stopped posting. I went back to what my spiritual advisor, Jivy, said to me. You release too much power when you speak too much. When you take the time to heal in silence, your voice will become powerful again. Do not be afraid to cut off social media, to go live by yourself, and to go heal. He said, you know, people go through a car wreck and they go in convalescence to a hospital onwards through healing. But when you go through a life wreck, in which everything has been disrupted, how much of an effort do you take to heal? Do you actually make an effort to convalesce? And how you do that process will reveal your own healing. At first I was, I was above my pay grade, but then I started seeing the truism of it when I flung myself into finally being comfortable, eloquently speaking to the world again. You know, since the day of my release, the hardest thing was to suppress this beautiful vernacular that I developed. And the way that I derived all of this autodidactic effort in a truly beautiful manner i always felt couldn't be unleashed because in my personal life it was just too much i had to kind of dull it down to let it not be this beautiful person who could be taken by the hand by an actress dressed as cleopatra walked onto the beautiful globe stage in london and introduced to an audience and to be eloquently beautiful for five solid minutes and then change that was hard imagine for the first time truly feeling like you've been let alone enough to finally go back to being like I was in isolation, beautifully alive. So all of this loss that I went through in 2020 and 2021 and having everything taken from me again, reinforced the message I gave to myself while sitting on death row. If everything is going to be taken from you, don't react with sorrow. Just turn to yourself, be kind to yourself, and try to give yourself everything. 
I proved a point to you recently in our personal lives that we know of each other, and I shared something with you. Imagine the worst moment of my life has nothing to do with death row. Imagine that it is so deeply hurting that this morning when I woke up, I had to shake it off again. Today, David, before I spoke to you, I had the same nightmare that visits me since January of 2016 when I experienced the SIDS death of a six-month-old child named Jamie Lee. But on top of this, you know I'm being stalked and tortured by people who want to saliciously and cruelly make out like I somehow harmed a child that died of SIDS. That I couldn't be this dynamic, lovely father to whatever child I've ever held in my life. That I have to be sinister. And you and I know that whenever something like that is aimed at me, my response, my abilities have taught me that's the day I bathe, I shave. I have a lovely meal, and I give myself ice cream and other treats, don't I, David? Like if it was someone hurting you, that's what you would get. Mm -hmm. and this is the lesson that I'm only sharing this from. No matter what your detractors try to make of you, whatever anyone has ever said of you, to down you, to denigrate you, it is your duty to not respond to them, but to actually spoil yourself, to reward yourself with kindness and be nice to yourself because not only does it frustrate that person who has aimed all of that at you, but it thus begins the neuroplasticity healing that allows you to erase that. The whole thing I led up to with this is the point that I wanted last to make to you before we spoke today, I made to you yesterday. I said to you, I am so good at this neuroplasticity healing. Death row itself is like a fond memory to me or a weird memory to me of a film that I once watched many times, but it's not my life. And that is really the essence of neuroplasticity healing. I have gotten so good that I don't really have lingering memories of death row that ever bother me or I have to actually strive to recall some of it now. Wow. It's that powerful. Yes. In plain English, what is neuroplasticity? Your example eliminated it, but for the listeners who might not have heard that phrase before, okay. how would you describe it? According to my good friend, Robin Sharma, neuroplasticity is understanding the process of your brain's reward system. When you go into a room and you have an exchange of meticulous, polite behavior with another human being, your brain is firing off neurons that is seeking a reward system for you and if that person smiles back to you or graciously responds to you, you are inside your brain releasing all of these wonderful neuroplasticity healing neurons that are instantaneously erasing PTSD. Wow. Now, that sounds like a mouthful, so I'll explain it this way. Charm. A person who has acquired self-confidence and exudes charm has mastered neuroplasticity's benefit. Charisma. A charismatic person is someone who has adopted neuroplasticity and is able to project it artistically 
as actors and others do, and this is why we gravitate to them. The number one fear people have outside of dying is speaking in public, to be performing because they're not really prepared for it. They haven't mastered the benefits of understanding neuroplasticity's charm and charisma and what it can compel you to become. I'll give you an idea. I am so super bright that within 10 months of my release, I was standing in the lower house of the House of Commons in London addressing Parliament. <laughs> I am so tremendously bright. I wrote the book Monsters and Mad Men in three days just to finally get the story out of me because I. I really held that back. I am so tremendously bright. I brought the entire Human Rights Council to its feet in Geneva by addressing them, following my film being shown to them in that amazing building. It wasn't just them seeing the film that brought them to their feet. It's what my energy did to that room then. I started to grasp this. Once I went way past the base understanding of what neuroplasticity could do to heal me from what I went through as a child or in prison or any of these things, I then was masterfully alive enough to the artistic side of my brain to take this to the next level where I can walk into a room and blow it away. Whoa. David, I have had experiences in London. I have a very dear friend of mine, Emma Dotson, can verify this. She was there. Imagine having a combined London student configuration of about 800 students who invariably were noisy and disruptive through each of the presentations they were experiencing during this uh, conference. That's what it was. It's in a beautiful town in London, a little small section of it. Within a few minutes of me walking onto that stage, you couldn't hear a breath. This is when I started to understand something, David. The human voice is the most powerful tool that we have. And like it is written in Sanskrit, the power that you emanate of using the words that you are speaking command either attention or they drive people from you. Because we are energy. We are chemical, and this is true. I get it. That's why I couldn't understand why I was so enraptured by one speaker I heard. My whole world changed from listening to Bruce Springsteen deliver a speech before the Academy Award about his song, Philadelphia, that had been nominated and won the award for best song. I realized everyone was captivated by his artistic display of his brilliance. Not as singer, but to talk to the world about the point that he was making. And okay. as such, it was, yeah. And he spoke about the relevance of the entwined combined need for our memory process to be preciously held between music and the visualization of film, encapsulating for us all how real it is that we as human beings are so much more enamored with what is real to us if we can somehow put it to music. That's why the fear of 13 mm -hmm. came to life. Because I've watched 
sitting on death row, Bruce Springsteen deliver a speech. When I saw that man in my cell deliver that speech, I knew I was right. That one day I was going to ask for a platform that would allow me to go ahead and record my story by sharing the music that was so important to me. What a powerful intro to not only how we met, but why I'm doing this for Alex and what inspired me to be the person that I am all in one go. Nick, for our friends, our listeners, please take it back to the beginning. Where did your story start? I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in one of the hardest parts of America. In the 1960s, America was experiencing a lot of the same racial hatred that it was going through now in the aftermath of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. While all this chaos was raging around, I became the victim of an assault by an older uh, boy in my neighborhood who sexually assaulted me and then hit me in the head with a field stone and bashed the front of my head and, and left me with aphasia. Now, long before Bruce Willis was diagnosed with this, and a lot of people are starting to become aware of what aphasia is, basically, your brain gets locked into a daydream. And in that daydream state, I'll give you a, um, a relevant idea of what it's like. Have you ever caught yourself between waking states where you're just holding on to your sleep? You don't want to really open your eyes and you're caught there, but you're conscious enough of what's around you at the same time. Yeah, almost like reality has warped a little. Yeah, we'll live with that all day as a boy. I was so angry, I couldn't, I couldn't stop it. I was so angry as a child, I started lashing out. And I had to wear eyeglasses. And I went from being a right-handed child to left-handed. Like, the hematoma on the front of my head was massive. I was treated at the Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia in 1968. Seven-year-old boy take that kind of head trauma. It changed everything for me, David. I, I didn't know how to process anything because I was suffering from aphasia. And I couldn't understand why I couldn't get things right. When, when I got angry, language had no meaning. When people were shouting at me, I couldn't understand them. And then I'd get angry and it would all shut down and I'd become monocyted when it got too much. And while I'm dealing with this, I got the guy in my neighborhood who did all this to me living right around the corner. So as a little boy, I remember going into my parents' basement and punching myself in my thighs over and over to will myself to withstand any pain so I could get tough. I didn't understand that I was developing myself to be a replica of my attacker. It all came to fruition, my recognition of this. When I was 19 years old, six foot two, 220 pounds, and I was ripped. I had already been through the juvenile justice system, trained as a boxer. I was a terror in my neighborhood and everybody hated me and I hated myself. One day, while standing by a creekside in Darby, Pennsylvania, my attacker came down a hill and saw me standing on this elevated cement platform that had once held a transformer for an electric company. As he walked up to me, I rose up out of my seat and stood there looking down on him, and suddenly 
my mythological tormentor who was so big in my head and who had intimidated me for so long was a five foot nine hundred and seventy five pound dude. And instantaneously, he recognized the superior situation and started to gratuitously do this milk toast thing in front of me where he was pleading with me to suddenly understand him. As I looked down on him, I realized I could just wipe the floor with this. And then... As I saw further into what that moment meant for me, I realized I was nothing more than him. A hateful bully, coward, drug addict, loser, drunk, piece of shit. I didn't do anything to him. I threw my beer bottle on the ground and told him to get the F away from me. And I began running in the opposite direction with tears in my eyes because I was so angry I was going to kill him. I ran away from home. I ended up in a mental institution in South Florida State Hospital where I was first diagnosed with a brain disorder. They found me in a hotel room in Miami after I destroyed it because I couldn't stop the rage. I saw myself, David. And I hated myself so much I wanted to die. After I was released from the mental institution, I was sent back to Pennsylvania. I got a job. I had a nice little job. I was clean from all drugs. The doctors told me the only reason I was having this debilitating onset of chaotic, crazy behavior is because I chose the one drug that made it horrible, methamphetamine. For a person who is dealing with aphasia, imagine that that dream world opens up and you get into it. Like you don't care that you're not in reality because you're creating your own, and it's so diabolical you can't remember creating it. Man. When I was on meth, I had a real world that I wasn't afraid in. Nobody raped me. I was fucking invincible. But I couldn't see the damage it was doing to my brain. So I was sober for nine months from the, all that treatment and everything in hospital and all this stuff. I get a job. I have a girlfriend named Teresa. I'm going to work down in the center city, Philadelphia. And I'm really liking myself. I'm the most polite person suddenly because I'm out of Southwest Philly, the ghetto. I'm able to go down in town and pretend to be a normal person outside of my life where I'm not just Nikki Harris from Southwest Philly. And if you go to 74th Street, they'll cut your heart out like that gang that I was with was tough. Right. So. But then I was humiliated by the girl who told me that I was like stupid for thinking that I was like this hot guy or whatever like I was pretending and I probably was because I was 20 years old you know so I remember getting high with my boys on the corner I stole this car I drove down to her work and she told me off and as I was leaving I get chased by the highway patrol in Philly they chased me down beat me up and put all these stitches in my mouth look see that yeah. They destroyed my mouth with a beaver tail blackjack. This is December 4th, 1981. In four, and, and so 17 days later, I would be arrested in the city of Chester driving another stolen car because in those two weeks that I was in my parents' house healing from that beaten drinking beer to actually telling myself I was healing the cut in my mouth by getting drunk and shooting meth in my parents' basement, uh, bathroom. Like my mom actually opened the door once while I had the needle in my arm and she almost saw it. Like I was so embarrassing. I'm fighting with my two brothers who were still alive at the time. 
my parents had enough, man. They would just. So December 20th, I went out partying in a stolen car. And I get pulled over in the city of Chester, Pennsylvania by Officer Benjamin Wright. And now I don't get out of the car and run because I'm so paranoid about getting my face beaten two weeks ago from the Philadelphia cops. I'm in panic mode because I have aphasia. I can't react. I'm sitting in my car and this cop is yelling at me and I can't respond to him. He rips the door open. He grabs me by the shirt front, pulls me out of the car. He's angry. I'm terrified. But then fight or flight kicks in because he did the stupid thing of putting his forearm up on my throat and cutting off my windpipe. And that was it. Just like Superman jumps out of me. I'm so powerful. Like I I can't believe this, but I have some kind of crazy gift that kicks in. This is why I would go on later on to survive all of the traumas that I have of cage fighting other death row prisoners and everything because something in me is super powerful and I feel it. Look, David, I took the officer's nightstick out of his hand after pushing him back like a child holding a toy. When he reached for his pistol, I grabbed his hand and pushed downward. It wasn't going up. And as I held the gun in his, in, in, his, which was in his hand and his wrist like that, and I pushed downward, he couldn't move. And he was just going in, infuriatingly crazy in his mind. After the gun went off, everything stopped because I started screaming, okay, okay, giving up like that's enough. Please stop. Puts me in the car, he locks the door, he gets on the radio and pretends that the story's still going on and calls for backup by saying that there was shots fired, officer assist, help, help, I'm under attack. Man, when the other cops got there, they beat the hell out of me, put me in a paddy wagon, they call it. They drove me to the Chester City Jail, and in the first 15 minutes, I had four different visitors in my cell. I got charged with the attempted murder and kidnapping of a police officer for a crime that I didn't commit. And I went nuts in my head and I fell upon myself because I was on a drug binge for two weeks and I crashed and I crashed and I crashed. The only thing I remember from that night was the public defender wasn't much older than me at the bail hearing when he explained to me that I faced life imprisonment for all these charges and that I wasn't ever going to get out. That was all I remember. So they threw me in the Delaware County Prison in maximum security. And I went through drug withdrawals with no treatment. And my brain was aching for anything that I could do to stop this torment. It was four days before Christmas. How was I going to call home and tell my parents I'm in prison facing life? I just got out three months ago and I promised to be good. I promised to stop doing meth. I told them proudly about my treatment. So I actually lied to the police and everything. I'm going to have told them. At first, a different name. I was so embarrassed. I didn't even want to be Nick Yaris. And I had a newspaper in my cell. And this stupid newspaper had the front page missing. So the only story I could see was about this mystery in the area about the rape and murder of a woman who had been abducted. When I sat there thinking about this lie that was told on me, four different visitors came to get me that night. And they beat the hell out of me. I know I was wrong to make up a story in prison to try to barter my way out of the attempted murder of a police officer. That was a lie. But me making up a lie to answer their lie was used against me in the worst way because although I would be found not guilty by a jury of that lie, the police officer made up about me of attempted murder. I got charged with the rape and murder of that woman because I made up a lie saying I knew something about it. 
and they twisted it and got a prisoner who had burglarized the prosecutor's home to say I confessed to him. I couldn't believe that I was being not only charged, but I was taken to trial with no evidence, no witnesses, no murder weapon, and just words. I was 20 years old and they were laughing at me. They used to mock me because the prosecutor made up a, a motive about this crime and said that the reason that I committed the crime is because I broke up with my girlfriend, Teresa, and this woman must have bore a likeness to my 20-year-old girlfriend somehow, and that's why I went out and killed her. And because I got charged with a psychological crime at a time when the president of the United States had just been shot by John W. Hinckley to impress an actress by the name of Jodie Foster, no less, anybody who was charged with a psychological crime was trounced. You, you weren't going to a mental institution. They're going to put you to death. So I was given a three-day trial at the age of 20 and sentenced to die in 1981, 1982. And then began the most amazing journey of my life. Despite the brutality and being openly tortured, I excelled. I survived my first unit that had a life expectancy of five years for any man locked up inside of that unit. I lasted 12 years. I did things I never imagined myself capable of because a prison officer came to my cell one day and got me to start reading books instead of beating my head on a wall in anger. It was his magnanimous, gracious gift that I started to develop everything I would become as a person. One act of humanity on death row changed the world. Just like a waitress having a woman spit in her face made me love you today. One officer giving me the inspiration to grow has saved thousands of lives. After I did Joe Rogan's podcast, I went back and I looked recently. Over 600 people's lives I talked out of killing themselves, and four to 5,000 people are now sober because of me. The human voice calls to us, but we need somebody who has been torn asunder and is handling something so powerful that we resonate with it. We find within that person some glimmer of who we are. And we gravitate towards that, hoping that it's true about ourselves, wanting it to be true. Can we be this person? Can we truly, in the face of what they're going through, be that magnificent? How do we find it? How do, what is that ingredient we, we ask of ourselves? How is it that I have locked into the secret where I can be at peace? And you personally recently know things about me that many people re watching and sharing this podcast won't know. David, I'm telling you right now. The one reason I wanted you of all people to begin listening to me. Is because. In a few years. Every part of you that experienced your mother's death will be erased. Every seven years, neurodermioplast and dermioblast go through your system. The dermioblast is our molecules erasing your bone structure 
and changing you from a seven-year-old to a 14-year-old to a 21-year-old. Notice it's in that seven-year cycle. Science has shown every seven years you're giving a brand new you. So trust me when I promise you, the day that you experience that is going to be erased and is now being erased. So if that's true, you can let go of that hurt. And it's the same analogy when someone wrongs you in life. If something happened to you as a child, as it did to me, that person and I myself have both been erased by time's development of who we are. How could I possibly waste my time thinking about, fixating so, about what is gone? I have so many questions that I want to ask. One of them is, I've heard you describe yourself as the most dangerous man in prison, not because of your physical stature or your ability to provoke violence, but because you were well read, because you had read books. Why did that make you the most dangerous man in, in the unit or in prison? It was, it was beyond just the reading of books. It was my ability to befriend others and help them either with their legal work, studies, or more importantly, helping them write letters home to mom. Imagine that your brain is scrambled and you really can't write beautifully. And you need somebody to help you. You don't, you don't want to miss out on it, you know? But there were some guys in there that, that they were truly illiterate. So the fact that I started helping guys by studying their cases and pointing out legal issues for them to take to their lawyers or helping them with letters to mom or doing legal studies for them or school studies with them or for them. If you put your hands on me, somebody would light you up. So the guards had to be very, very careful after a while because there was about two dozen men around me who looked to me for solace, comfort, guidance. You see, I grew up in there, David. I went from a 20-year-old kid going into prison to being in my 30s and 40s. And the fact that I was there when they landed and they were still going through the shock and awe of that door being slammed in your face. I was there. I was the one that taught them how to get their, their sheets changed and cleaned properly or what to look out for. A guider. It made me truly dangerous to the staff because a lot of guys didn't want to see me have any problems. You... My kindness made me the most. Yes, my kindness made me the most dangerous man on death row. You spoke to me about how the body goes through cycles every seven years. You were wrongfully imprisoned for three cycles. You had watched those inmates, those younger inmates that you helped. You watched them probably go or morph between those seven year cycles how did you did you notably see yourself change in three separate stages of seven years and did you watch others within the same units do the same here's the fascinating thing i saw none of that i had no mirror in my cell i had a piece of metal plate and it was affixed to the wall that was heavily scratched and damaged by the previous occupants of my cell. I didn't look at my face for years and years and years. I didn't see my physical development, but I had a unique situation very few people can identify with. Let's say... At certain times, while in the punishment unit, 
you and I would be next to each other for two years and I would never know what you look like. I would only know you by your voice. We would know each other and become friends and know who each other are in a way that no others really get to do with sight. I also found this out about my own life. When I was 42 years old, and finally, DNA testing proved me innocent and I was set free, I was absolutely dumbfounded as to who that 42-year-old person was that was speaking on camera to the news cameras. Who was that? That wasn't the man I knew or was known by others. Who was this man wearing plastic prison glasses, a baseball cap, and prison clothes, it looked like? I was thin, pale, unanimated in my features. No laugh lines, no wrinkles. I looked like someone had stuck the face of a 25-year-old child onto a 40-year-old's body. I had no dermatological damage done to me by UV rays and exposure to sunlight. My skin was supple and soft and beautiful, but my features had developed, didn't they? No laugh lines. Fascinating. And everyone thought, surely, a man convicted of a psychological-based murder openly tortured on death row for three decades, must have mental disabilities that make him pitifiable. And yet, I was the brightest person in the room most times. It was within me to fight off my own need to pity them for their mental issues that were holding them back from having loving bonds that weren't distorted with all kinds of dysfunction. You see, mm -hmm. it was this remarkable thing to have read 9,400 books before I stopped counting, spent six years of my life studying psychology in university, read and became a polished litigator of the law, having successfully gotten two other death row prisoners released from death row or a given their freedom back. And yet, people looked at me as if I was mentally distorted because I had experienced something they in no way fathomed within themselves an ability to endure. They could only think of the cell. They couldn't think of the person. They could only think of being on death row, living under a death sentence, while they stood there at that moment, living under a death sentence. But there was no appeal process out here on the streets, is there? You don't get told by a court that you're going to be put to death or you're going to die on a certain day. But yet, we live like vampires. We stand on the sidewalk, we have a puff of cigarette, and we act like we're not going to die. <laughs> I know I'm going to die. The crazy thing is death row taught me how to live beautifully in manners I only again felt recently. I was so alive inside there, David, because I didn't fight and struggle against the death penalty. I ignored it. When they told me you're never getting out of here, you have a hundred years Plus the death penalty, you're going to die right where you're sitting. Do you understand me, Mr. Harris? Well, for me, that was a wake-up call to live as much as I possibly could. That must be a weird and difficult mindset to have because... Within your sentence, there was 
moments where you almost tasted liberty. Some being DNA, some being the the altercation or the incident where you were transferred between prison. Can you talk about the times where you were perhaps hopeful that you might regain freedom, both through DNA and through the circumstances in terms of uh, transferring through prisons? Because I think both those anecdotes almost gave you a flavour of what life could have been again if both were successful. So in 1985, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court sent my case back to the trial court because of all of the misconduct that took place. Imagine, I've just been in solitary confinement for three and a half solid years. I'm scared to death about hope because that's a terrifying thing when you're so young. I was 24 years old and my case just got remanded back to the Supreme to the trial court because, A, I was tried in Pennsylvania for underlying crimes such as kidnapping and other crimes that happened in the state of Delaware, that B, I was uh, denied all of the information in the homicide file relating to the actual description of the killer being a five foot five brown hair uh, man with long black or brown greasy hair. And all of the witness testimony and witness statements about the relevance of this person was taken from the files. So me, I'm looking forward to going to court and getting my day in court when we stop at a gas station. And the craziest thing is I went to use the toilet and the officer that was with me listening to me urinate simply got overwhelmed with the urge to urinate himself, didn't he? He holds the door for me, but he lets me run back to the car alone. And the officer that was standing back at the car with his back to me turned around and saw me running at him and within a second just pulled his gun out. Like, you find yourself in times in life where you know the energy all around you is pulling you and you have nothing to say about it. Like a car skidding on a road, I could not stop the events of that night. The pistol coming up, I could still see the muzzle. When I turned, I felt the percussion of the blast against the backside of my neck. It almost blew my brains out right there. I was only 15 yards from him when he fired the first two shots. For the next 25 days, I was on the FBI's most wanted list for being a convicted death row rapist murderer who had broken free from custody. It wasn't freedom. That lesson right there taught me that something that big you'll never be free of. You have to have the courage to face something that big. I found the nerve at the age of 24 to turn myself back in, knowing that they were going to beat the piss out of me, and they did. They broke my face a year and a day to the incident of my escape back in Huntington Prison in a property room. They broke my teeth. They busted my face, detached my ret and my left eye, left me with lifelong lingering injuries that till this day still physiologically hurt me. They stuck a riot club through my arms while they were handcuffed and they used it to lift me up and parade me back and forth before these windows that were facing the death row cells opposite my unit so that they could show everybody what they did. It took me months and months to look at myself in that piece of metal on the wall. It took a lot of courage to come out of my cell and not feel shamefully ugly for what they did to me. And you know what I did, David? I found a photograph of myself when I was 17. I was in Tawanda, Pennsylvania on the Schuylkill River. 
and I had caught an enormous carp. A photograph of me was taken. There's only like six photographs of me as a child in life. This was one of them. Holding up that fish, I felt so proud of myself to have someone take a picture of me because I really wasn't cared for in that manner a whole lot. Let's just say I probably drove that to be true. I put that photograph on the wall of my cell. And I began to practice speaking to myself beautifully. I didn't want to be executed for this woman's murder. And then be given a chance to speak for myself and flub it, to embarrass myself, to not be able to eloquently articulate my compassion for them, my forgiveness for their murder of me, my understanding of who I became before them while they held me in their hands. So I began to beautifully speak to myself, but I had a very limited ability with words. I got really frustrated. So I started to really read. I took the dictionary apart and practice and practice and practice. I used to live whole days based on the accumulation of understanding and speaking words beautifully to the point that I remember time flying by as I ate the dictionary, the thesaurus, and the beauty and eloquence of books that were written by artists so that they had this developmental meaning to me of not the visualization of the story, but the visualization of the person's life it must have taken to create such a tale. Oh, man. I started to become so at peace with myself because I was finding that despite the beating for escape and all the hardship, I had a remarkable ability to find beauty within myself. And it was the things that were done to me that were allowing me to find it. I had no idea about neuroplasticity healing. None of this was relevant. I just knew that if I treated myself magnificently, think about that word, the magnification of who you are, then I could handle this. But I had to magnify a part of myself that was so strong, I had to turn to Nikki, that kid that caught that fish, the one who could run up the hillside of that riverbank without even breaking a sweat. That kid could jump over an automobile with one bound. Like, that was the kid. Like, man, the athlete in me, I understood. But there was also that part that if it could be magnified in physiological terms, that person, that part of me, could truly become magnificent as a person. I had no idea how to get there as a young person. You got to remember, I'm 25 years old. I'm sitting there probably 110 years of total sentences plus a death penalty. I don't understand neuroplasticity. All I know is I want the pain in my head to stop. And I want the torment that's being aimed at me by others not to matter. So I became my own best friend and began to beautifully speak to myself. I began practicing my death speech, knowing that I would have the self-respect of knowing I hadn't done it also drive within me the compassion to forgive the people who were murdering. Uh, and there was a moment where you found out you would never have to give that speech, Nick, where the practice of 
learning how to portray yourself in the most eloquent way, that practice didn't need to come to, to ultimate fruition because your innocence was proven. Was there a part of you that, I don't want to say renounced the fact that you were proven innocent, but all this work until that moment was no longer essentially necessary because you never had to give that speech. Was there a part of you that renounced that? What a thing to carry. The thing that was driving me nuts was I had to get it out of me. When I first got out, I was really, really ill. and I was told that I had to have a liver transplant because of the renal failure of my liver. So when I got out, I didn't think I had long to live. I was just happy to be alive, you know, and I wanted my mom to have some good time with me, you know. And I remember I was so put off that I had the world's biggest lead up to your stage moment, only to have the microphone ripped from your hand and you're not allowed to do this speech, that I went up to the northeast of America and this big boulder on a wonderful mountaintop overlooking this beautiful river. And I let loose. And I did the speech beautifully. And at the end, I took a bow. And I knew I was going to be okay because I didn't flub it, David. That was my only fear as someone who lives with aphasia and a brain injury. The last thing you would want is something that you've rehearsed and practiced for years misses by a nuance. But I was so free of the pain and the lingering loss that I did it beautifully. And I stopped having that horrible dream. You see, many years, I just couldn't protect myself in my sleep. The horrors around me were so immense. I would be executed in my sleep. And in a practice fashion, I would be strapped to the gurney. At first, it was the electric chair, so it was really messed up because you got a hood over your face. They don't want to see your eyeballs explode. So I would have to practice my speech the first few years with a pillowcase over my head. Then they changed the method of executing you to stretch you out on a gurney. So I would lay in my bed and practice. The only time it started to really work was I put that photograph on the ceiling of myself. I looked up at that kid strong, beautiful kid. I said, come on, Nikki. Get me through this. Let me have the courage to let them kill me without falter. That's badass. I mastered that. I started helping others. See, I had a plan. I was okay with being put to death, David. So, if that was the thing, then I was just going to go on and just do what I wanted. I had some remarkable friendships in there. You can't help undo a person's humanity. You, you, like you can't undo that. Like that's that's wrong. You can't. If they're doing it to themselves, that's fine, but you can't help them do that. You can only help them find their humanity again. You know, I've had remarkable bonds that, with people that ate other human beings and did 
disgusting, despicable things. Do you know I cared for men that butchered children? I took on and tried to help men whose minds were so distorted, I was basically their only friend after being castigated and put to death by society. It takes an enormous amount of humanity to find humanity in others, especially when you've been tortured by humans. And they break your heart, tell you you're worthless. You know, I was asked only one thing when I got out of prison. It became the most powerful thing I've ever done in my life. My mother very simply asked me to be a polite, kind man, to show respect for us as a family for what was done to us. She gave me the keys to neuroplasticity healing because meticulous politeness with other human beings is the cornerstone of releasing neuroplasticity healing. So my one promise to my mother upon release that, yes, mom, I swear I'll say yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, thank you and please. To show respect for our family combined for being destroyed and release everybody from being hated by me with my own kindness. And that's all we've got time for in part one. Tune in for part two next week where we understand how Nick came back from literally having his face beaten. How can he be polite and keep that promise despite suffering at the hands of so many? We speak about post-incarceration for Nick. Please stick around and tune in for part two, which I promise you will be just as moving as this one. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, subscribe, or do whatever and whatever platform you are on to show your appreciation. And like I said, if you'd like to buy me a coffee, head along to buymeacoffee.com forward slash D by D. Hope to see you around for part two. Thank you for listening.